Healing Hands Health Society presents Dental Webinar Series. We have planned a series dental webinars to keep you abreast of current practice. This series on prosthodontics will be via Zoom, Facebook Live. Presenters are drawn from dental schools in the USA, private practitioners from around the world. To register for future webinars, visit www.hhands.org backslash dental dash training. For future inquiries, contact facilitator Dr. Tiago to introduce himself and to share his screen and to talk about um, the the basics of dental photography. Welcome uh, Dr. Uh, Tiago Veras. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, hello everybody first of all. <laughs> uh, it's a Big pleasure for me to speak for you today to show a little bit of what we are doing here in Brazil. Uh, I'll start sharing my screen right now so you can see what I'm seeing. Let's see. Okay. Uh, is it all good? Uh, Let me play. Yeah. Okay. Let me just uh, reproduce. Is that okay so far? Perfect. Okay. Perfect. So uh, let me introduce first a little bit. Uh, my name is Thiago Veras Fernandes. Here in Brazil, everybody call me Thiago Veras. And uh, I, I'm working as a dentist for 15 years right now. Uh, and at the first, I was a dental technician, but never worked as a technician. Also a uh, dental implant specialist, as my friend here below. And my main area of actuation is static dentistry. So it's where I made my master's degree, my PhD. And I feel that I needed to show a little bit of my work to the world. And the best tool I know for this is dental photography. I don't, I don't have many ideas how to show a, a, a better picture of myself than with a good dental photography. So thinking this, this, like this, uh, I started doing some basic photographies, amateur photographies, and start learning about equipments, about light especially. So I think this is a, a very good message about Roland Barthes that say that photography is a message without a code. It, it's perfect, it resumes what photography means to us. It's totally physical, it's totally uh, exact, but also artistic. It, it's very interesting to know and how to master the light so you can share your vision to the world about your work. So let me start the presentation for you. First of all, I don't know if everybody knows these pictures, but this is the first picture made by men First dental, uh, first photography, and for you to know, just to notice, this is a, a the, the lithographer, the French lithographer, took eight hours to generate this picture with silver soft. He posed the uh, uh, platinum mate uh, uh, into the sun, and this was posed for eight hours and generate this kind of picture. So this is where the photography starts. But I'm pretty sure if the same lithographer in these days recorded, took a photograph of Paris, it will be something like this. And the difference between those pictures is a, a digital sensor, it makes all the difference, uh, the high dynamic range of these photos and the contrast and the light. So this is where we are right now. We are on the digital photography era. So this is a very, very, big step for us and it is it makes our life much easier with the advent of something that you can share in the same moment that you took the picture so when I begin starting my first photographies my photographies they need to be shown uh, of course I want to promote myself with my photographies but I also think the photography is a great a, a amazing tool for uh, diagnostics. For example, 
this is a composite resin case I made in my clinic. And after four hours doing this case, I took photography and start analyzing the photography. So as you can see, there is uh, some kind of access in this uh, cervical area of the central incisor. You have a little bit of access in there and in there. So if I didn't took this photography, I'm pretty sure I wouldn't see this. And this is uh, another chance for me to look at this and say, oh, okay, uh, I need to fix this. So I call the patient again, and now I'll, I'll deliver the final result, correcting this flaws and giving a, a better boost in the final treatment. So you, as you can see, uh, the photography is a, a great tool for things like this. Is your patient available for you 24 hours? It's amazing. Another thing, if you think my photography is good, I'm pretty sure uh, you didn't see my first photography because this is my first photography. As you can see in this picture, uh, my main goal was to show the, uh, the, the treatment plan for the patient and say, yeah, let's do some veneers on this case. But as you can see, the photography is awful. As the color is not right, the lighting is not right. As you can see, there is a barrel distortion on the picture. And the only right thing I did in this picture is to took the picture. The other thing is all wrong. The, but with time and what we call the, the, uh, the learning curve, you can see you can get better results like this. This is what I want to show in that time of my life. But I didn't, didn't have the knowledge for this. The same goes here. Look at this. This is awful also. I, I want to sell this, this picture. I want to sell this treatment, but I can see the floor of my clinic. I can see the sector. I can see the hair on the nose of the patient. So it's very bad. Uh, this, this don't sell. On the other hand, if you have something like this, of course you can sell a more impactating picture. Uh, pretend you're a patient. Pretend you're not a dentist anymore. And if, if the same picture was shown to you, huh, this is my final result, and this is my final result, what would you buy? So you need to think a little bit. You need to show uh, how good is your work, and you not show how good is your work if you, if you don't have a good dental photography. Well, if you master the light correctly, you can also take pictures of the face of your patient in a very spontaneous ways. So you can give to the patient the picture in the final result and they can promote you for free. For example, if I, if I send a picture like this to, to this woman, I'm pretty sure she will post on her social medias and you'll be known as her dentist. So it's a very good thing for you also. And you can take pictures of prosthodontics, uh, implants, faces, anywhere. Anything you want, anywhere you want, you can record it with a picture that will last forever. So even with a cell phone, an old cell phone, a Galaxy Note, as you can see, you can get a very good result with the correct technique if you understand what light is and what light can do for you. Okay, now that we know all of this, I'm pretty proud of showing these pictures to you because none of these pictures are mine. This is all for my, from my students here in Brazil. As you can see, the technique can be reprodu reproduced and it's very easy once you master the, the basics of photography. But the main question I want to answer for you today is what is the ideal equipment so we can start doing those kind of photographies? Because equipment is something very, very difficult to find, to, to choose. Actually, to find is really easy, but to choose the correct equipment can be very challenging. So I'll try to give you a very good idea of what kind of equipment we don't need and what kind of equipment is the ideal equipment for dental photography. So let's search a little bit. 
Uh, let's compare our equipment to cars. I really love cars in Brazil. Everybody loves cars. So I will compare my equipment with a Ferrari. For example, Ferrari is the best what we can find in sports cars. It's amazing car, great technology, great everything. But if you look the Ferrari and compare it to a Lamborghini, as you can see, it's two different kinds of cars, completely different types of cars, but they all share the same advantage. They are the best in their classes, okay? So, but they are completely different. Im imagine the following. Imagine if you live on this hill, on the top of this hill, and you need to get this road every day of your life. If you have the Ferrari, it, the Ferrari will not last even a week. But if you have a, a, a road like this, a perfect road like this, it will be amazing to have a Ferrari. So what we compare, if, in, in, a, in a road like this, in a dirty road like this, you need something like an SUV. And in a good road like this, you need a Ferrari. So if you spend a lot of money in a very, very, very good equipment, but that equipment is not fitted to dentistry, so you'll not get results. It doesn't matter if your camera or your lens worth more than $10,000. It doesn't matter because you don't get results. And this is what we are trying to teach you right now, to get results, uh, spending less money and gaining good results. Let's see. So first of all, why don't we use cell phones or compact cameras? Let's start with the defects, the flaws of this equipment. First of all, the small cameras means small digital sensor. The digital sensor is responsible for the final quality of the image. So if you have a small sensor, you cannot have a good handle of the light and the final quality will be dropped down. So this is, it's impossible with a cell phone or a compact camera, you have a, a big sensor. Second of all, the aperture is limited. Uh, as you can see, the aperture is, uh, is something related to the lens of these devices. And if you don't have a, a very closed aperture, you don't have what we call a depth of field. Depth of field is you need to focus your central scissor and you need to focus your molar. If you don't have enough deeper field, you cannot focus at the same picture, your incisor and your molar. So if you don't have this, it's a bad thing to choose a compact camera. You also need an external flash. Get this on your, uh, get this very, very, very clear on your head. Photography means draw or write with light. The most important part of your photography is light. And if you don't have a device or a camera that can handle an external light like a flash, and then you don't have a good equipment. You need to be able to control an external light with your camera or your device or something like this. For example, I cannot control a flash with a cell phone. I cannot control a flash with a compact camera. So this is not ideal equipment for us. And finally, uh, we use the manual mode of this equipment. And you don't have the manual mode on most of the simple equipment like a cell phone or compact cameras. So be very careful with this. And OK, Thiago, but what about the super zoom? Some people in Brazil call this a semi-professional camera. I don't think they are. The correct name is a super zoom because professional or not is the person behind the camera, holding the camera. I am the professional or I am the amateur holding the camera. So the super zoom is also a camera with small digital sensors. So the image is not that good. It cannot handle the light very good. The aperture is also limited. The, the best aperture I've seen in any of these super zoom called cameras, it was something like F11. And this is halfway what we needed. We need something like F22. So this is very, very wrong for dental photography. 
And in these cameras, some of them, they have a, a, a hot shoe for the flash, but they cannot control the flash as good as a specific camera for that. And final, final problem of this camera is the lens quality. The quality of this lens must be a very cheap lens. Otherwise, they cannot sell this camera for a cheap price. So you don't have the best of the lens and you have, don't have the best of the sensor and you are limited on the aperture. So this is a very big problem for dentistry. And now let's talk about what the ideal camera for us is, is what we call the DSLR. And the D is for digital and the SLR is for single lens reflex. This is a well-known camera for photographers for many years. And, the, advent, uh, and the, the, the beginning of the digital sensor era creates the best equipment for us. So in this way, we can photograph the patient and in the same session, send this photo for, for my dental technician, for example, to create a, a dental plan and everything. So what is the advantage of this equipment? First of all, even the cropped, version, cropped versions of this camera, the APS-C, they have a big digital sensor comparing to the uh, compact cameras and cell phones and super zoom cameras. So this is a ideal uh, size of sensor. It's a sensor that can handle light very good. So it's amazing to have a, a, a such a cheap equipment with a good sensor like this. Uh, in the enter models of this Canon and Nikon and Sony and everything like this. The aperture is dependent by, uh, is lens dependent. So if you have a correct lens attached to your DSL LR, you have uh, a perfect tool for dentistry. For example, you can have a macro lens attached to your DSLR and you have aperture going up to f20 32 so you have enough field enough depth of field for everything in dentistry and you can use an external flash and this is also a very good thing because as i told uh, talked before uh, the flash is responsible for the final result of the image if you have the right light you have you end up with good, very good pictures. And if you don't use the right correctly, you end up with very boring pictures. And you can also have complete control of this equipment with the manual mode. You can control the speed, the aperture, you can control the ISO. So you have everything you needed to get a very good picture. And okay, Chado, but what's the difference between the full frame and the APS-C crop, what we call a cropped sensor of the camera. Well, first of all, the price. The price is very different. If you are a dentist, uh, I'm telling you, you don't need a full frame camera. If you want to record videos and do something more professional and you depend a lot of low light situations, then maybe a full frame is a good thing for you. But otherwise, if you're using flash, and if you want to spend less money, then you don't need a full frame camera. It can, you can use an APS-C and you spend less money and you get good results as good as full frames. So as you can see on this picture, uh, you can see the sensor of a compact camera is 31 times smaller than a full frame camera. And why this is very important for me to know. Let's see why. Let's see the difference between the two cameras. Let's pretend, let me try to demonstrate this for you. Let's pretend this is my patient and this is my camera. And I will use a full frame camera to record, to take a picture of the mouth of this patient. If I keep the two distance the same all the time, and then we end up with a full frame with a picture like this, okay? Now let's only substitute the camera. The distance is the same, okay? But now we are using a cropped camera. Now we are using a camera, an APS-C camera. So if I change the camera, what will happen to the same picture is this. 
the picture will get a zoom. Okay, you, you, you see a little bit closer of your subject. Why this is happening? This is happening what we call the focal length of your lens. And with one thing very specific of this cropped lens is the crop factor. What is this? When you have a cropped sensor, you need to multiply the focal length of, a, of your lens to that crop, opa, sorry, uh, to that uh, rate to that of the, of the camera. For example, if you have a cropped rate of 1.6, that is Canon lens, Canon's camera, so you have a 100 millimeter mark, macro, turn it into 160 millimeter macro. So that's why you have this zoom on your image. That's the, the reason we need to, for example, if you're very, uh, very close to a picture with a full frame, if you change this camera to a crop it, you need to step a little backwards because this lens will behave differently from a full frame. And that's the main difference between those two cameras. Another big difference between, between these two equipments is that, let's try to simplify this with a picture. You, you get this girl and you say to her, hey, please paint me this, this be beautiful picture of Mona Lisa, but you can only use your brush on the whole brush. You need to use the whole brush to paint every time. You cannot use only the tip of the brush. And you can give her two options. First of all, you give her uh, a board of one meter. And the other options, you give her an outdoor of 31 meters. And now I ask you, in which of these situations we will achieve a better detailed information of this board? More details will happen, of course, on the 31 meters board. <clears throat> so this is, <clears throat> sorry. So this is the biggest difference between the cropped version and the full frame version. Uh, if you have a bigger sensor, more light will hit the sensor and more information will be captured and stored and you have the final quality of your image a little bit better, okay? And megapixel, different from people what thinks, megapixel is not, not important. As you can see in this, uh, in YouTube or Instagram or Facebook, something like this, where you see a full HD picture, you actually see two megapixels only. So it doesn't matter if your camera has 15, 100 megapixels. What matters for us is to obtain a good quality of the light in this picture. So megapixel is important only if you're printing this image. For example, if you wanna, wanna create an outdoor for advertising, and then, okay, megapixel maybe is important, but if you're posting your pictures on social medias or YouTube or something like this, then you don't need more than two megapixels because if you post a picture with 15 megapixels on Instagram, for example, it will, the Instagram will reduce your picture for, to one megapixel, so it doesn't matter. Okay, so megapixel is not that important. And as you can see, uh, if I have this picture on my full frame sensor and this picture on my cell phone, for example, I can do both of them to have, for example, 15 megapixels. What I need to do just to enlarge. But the problem is the quality, the detailed quality of the enlarged picture of the small sensor will never be the same as the big sensor. So that's the main difference between the sensor size. Okay, now we know that. Let's, uh, let me just pass this. Uh, let's go here. Here is more important. There it is. So if you like Nikon, uh, in Brazil, uh, the, the biggest sales in camera is made by me, Nikon and Canon. So we don't use much of Sony here. If you like Nikon, the latest cameras they have is the D350. 
D five six the wall and the D seven five the wall. So as you can see, the price is a little bit different on these cameras. And let's see what's the best cost benefit for us. For example, if you compare the entering model of Nico, that is three three five zero zero to five six zero zero, then you have a little bit of difference. So you can see what we have uh, uh, what, what we have to the difference and why we like to choose the intermediate model rather than the entering model in my opinion the most important aspect of the 5600 is the wi-fi the wi-fi is so good you with the wi-fi you can download the picture off your camera in the same moment that it took the picture you can send this picture to your dental technician so this makes our life way easier so i will never choose this camera rather than this because of the wi-fi of course uh you have uh, uh a microphone jack it's good if you like to record video and you have a better battery and this thing is also put some difference on your camera. But Thiago, do you think it's worth uh, doing the update from the 5600 to the 7500? Let's see. You end up with a better light sensitivity. And this is not very important for us because we are using flashes. It doesn't matter. If you're shooting low light, then this is very important. So this uh, then, okay. It's a good thing to change for this camera. You have a bigger battery. It can be a good thing for us, but actually this battery is big enough for many pictures. So I don't see a, a, a very good update unless you're recording videos, then, then it's a good update. And the burst is faster. We don't use burst, so it doesn't matter. It's weatherproof. It doesn't matter for us because <laughs> Our camera stays inside our clinic, our office, so it doesn't get dusty or water or something like this. And you have uh, a motor, a focus motor inside the, the, the body of the camera. So if you have a very, very ancient, very old lens, you can make this lens work as a automatic lens. It doesn't matter for us because we shoot everything on manual. So I don't think you need to spend that much money, $300 for this update. I think the 5600 is the best option we had for Nikon, okay? But if you're liking, if you're more like a Canon guy, then you can choose between several models. Uh, the SL3, the, the most uh, uh, cheap of, of them all, I don't recommend doing the, the, the lack of the central pin of the hot shoe. So if you're trying to use the SL3 to trigger an external flash, you'll not be able to, because Canon removed the central pin of the hot shoe, so, they can, so you can only use Canon original flash. So this is not good for us. This is not good anymore. So let's forget this camera, but let's compare the T7i with the T7 VIII, and with the 90D, that, that's the most uh, recommended equipment for Canon right now. So as you can see, if we compare the SL3 with the T7i, the T7i will give you 24 megapixels. You have uh, a, a, a screen that you can flip and you can turn the, uh, the screen so you can see better. It can record full HD videos. Uh, it has the cinema mode. There is a microphone jack, of, uh, of course, and a H HDMI output. And also the best of all, the T7i has Wi-Fi. So if you have a camera with Wi-Fi, then you have a very good tool on your hand. So I think this is the very best option right now. But if you want to spend one, uh, $150, more, $150 more, and you can buy a T8i, 
and then you can record videos on 4K. It's very good. There's also a better image processor inside Digic, and you also gain the Bluetooth capability. So that's a very good thing also for sending images or to show image to a patient to a big screen TV like this. And do you think I need an upgrade, for example, to the 90D only if you're buying, if you're buying the camera to use as a video recorder? Otherwise, uh, I don't recommend you get this update because the price you're paying, uh, almost uh, $1,200 is not that cheap. And with this price, you can buy almost a full frame camera. I don't think that's, that's worth the price, okay? But you get uh, uh, more megapixels, you get a bigger battery, you get a weatherproof that we don't need, uh, you get more speed that we don't need, and the, the, the part of the video that I said is very good is that you gain uh, what we call a face detection uh, focus based. Then this is very, very important for video because the focus will be sharper and uh, faster. So if you're thinking of video, then okay, you can go to 90D. Otherwise, don't do this. And now that we know how, what, camera to choose, what body of camera to choose, now let's start choosing our lens. The lens is very important for us. First of all, we will always use a macro lens. Uh, what kind of lens is a macro lens? It's a lens that is all con constructed to get the most close uh, to the subject that you can. Okay, this lens will generate very, very, very low distortion so you don't almost have no distortion at all and you have different focal lengths of these cameras the most used in the industry is 100 millimeters okay so this is all 100 millimeters macro lens from different brands like sigma nikon canon tokina all very good lens and the reason for us to use the macro lens is that they have the one-to-one -one, uh, proportion inside this lens. What this means, if you take your lens and put the lens where it can focus the object, the closest the lens can focus the object, and the object is two centimeters on this focal length, and then the object will have the same two centimeters on your sensor. So this, uh, this property of this lens made this lens to generate almost no distortion. And this is very good for us, so you don't have that barrel effect that everything in the middle of the picture would be very big and everything on the sides or the borders of the picture would be very small. And this is not good. We want uh, no distortion at the borders and we want no distortion at the center of the picture. This is what a good lens will do for you. And this is very, very important, so especially for face photography. As you can see, in this picture, I took with an 18 millimeters lens. So as you can see, this is a wide angle lens. So I need to put the lens very, very, very close to the patient. And the result is a very, very big nose and no ears. Where's the ears? As you can see, her face is totally distorted. So if you're trying to do a digital planning of this patient, forget it because it's all distorted. As you can see, if I change the focal length of my lens to 35 millimeters, the, the picture is completely different. And then we change to 55 to 85 until we get to 100 millimeters, the macro lens we are using right now. As you can see, completely different from this one. This is the right picture for this patient. This is the correct picture for this patient. So as you can see, if, you, if you're a very beautiful lady or a handsome guy, the only thing you do want to do is to make a selfies, okay? Selfies is there very good, very bad, very bad, because they will distort your face and you end up with a very big nose and no ears at all. 
So the best thing you can do is to go a little bit backwards with your cell phone. Ask someone to take a picture of you from a, something like two meters distance, and then you end up with less distortion, okay? So this is what a good lens do for us. And another very important thing about lens is every lens has what we call a sweet spot that is totally related to the lens sharpness. And what do you mean about that? If you have a, a correct opening of the diaphragm of the lens, you have less distortion occurring on this lens and you end up with a more sharpness on the final result. But let's see the, the, the science behind this. For example, if you use F5.6, as you can see both on the center or the border of the image, you end up with the best sharpness your lens can do to you. And as, a, as you can see, this is a macro 100 millimeters lens, and this is the same lens we use on dentistry, so if you stay on f 5.6, you have the best sharpness of your lens. On the other hand, if you're closing your diaphragm until you get f22, then the sharpness will drop a lot. And if you continue closing your diaphragm until you hit f32, then the sharpness of this lens will be a very, very bad sharpness. So what do I say to my students? They all ask me, okay, Thiago, but what is the correct aperture for my lens? Uh, what is the correct F number that I need to use on dentistry? And I always say to them, use the smallest number. And in other words, the, the biggest uh, opening you can use on your lens if you can see all your object in focus. If you can focus your main subject of the picture and you have a very good opening of your lens, of your, per, of your aperture, and then you're working in a very good way. If you're using every time the same aperture, the F32 of your lens, you end up with a very, very noisy image with low quality and not enough sharpness. And that's the difference. As you can see, in this picture, I took the picture with F32, and as you can see the eyes, they're kind of blurry, blurred eyes. And on the other picture that I took with F8, you can see the result on the eyes. The eyes is perfectly sharp. So this is the biggest difference between using uh, correctly the, the sweet spot of the lens and not using the sweet spot of the lens. Okay, so what about the light? The most important part of our equipment. The light, as you can see, is all generated by flashes. Flashes is the most important part of our dental photography. And all flashes use uh, gases inside, okay? Uh, what we call the, in Brazil, we call noble gases. I'm pretty sure this is the, the correct English word for this, this noble gases, and this is xenonium. This is the gas that is inside your flash. So when you trigger your flash, there will be an electric, elect, electricity charge on this gas. This gas will be excited and it will release uh, this excitement as a light. And this light, they all have the same temperature. And the temperature for xenonium is 5500K, okay? So 5500K is the correct temperature of the xenonium gas. So this is very good for us because if you know the temperature, you can correct your camera, you can correct the color of your camera using the flashes. In Brazil, we, we say that the, we used to say actually, that the ring flash is a flash based on the surgeries and if you do orthotronics or something like this. And the twin flash we can use if you're doing statics, if you're doing something anterior with, uh, for example, periodontics or something like this. But actually, 
I don't like the ring flash that much because as you can see, this patient, it has a lot of texture going on on this gingiva, but you can only see the texture in here. You cannot see the texture in here or in here. Uh, and you also, the central incisor has a lot of texture, but you can only see the texture on the cervical area, on the mid third, on the incisal third, you cannot see. So this is a very good flash if you are a very bad dentist. If you don't want to show you the, result, the real result of your work, and then maybe this is a good option because you hide everything. The main difference between the, uh, the ring light and the twin light is that the twin flash will generate shadows and light. And the most important part of the image to create the, the, the depth of the image is to create shadows. So you need the correct proportion of shadows and you need correct proportion of lights. So we end up with a, a gingiva that has textures in here and also has the textures in here. And you can see clearly that there is a texture on the, going on on this tooth. So for me, I don't use the ring light anymore. I only use the twin flash right now, okay? If you're buying from Canon, and then you can choose the NR14EX. I don't recommend this. This is very, very expensive and not a good flash. And you can use, of course, the MT24EX. This is a very, very good flash, but we have cheaper options with Chinese flashes right now. And if you're using Nikon, and then you depend on a system called R1C1, that is the, the flashes and the trigger. So this is a very, very good system, also a very expensive system that you can buy cheaper ones from China. As you can see right now, uh, Chinese made the ring flash. This is a very, very cheap ring flash. It costs less than one six of the Canon original flash. And you have the twin version of the same flash from Yongnu. Uh, the model is uh, YN24EX. Even the name is the copy of the original Canon flash, okay? Uh, and you can use also a Sigma flash, also very expensive. And I don't recommend this, especially to be, for being uh, a, a ring flash. And if you want to use a Canon as a wireless flash, you can use two flashes like this. This is a slave flash. You, you put on slave mode, and then you end up with a wireless system for your Canon equipment. It's a very good option also. So, after we buy the camera, we buy the lens, we buy the flash, and we also need some uh, extra equipment, accessories, so you can make your flash work better with your camera. The first accessory I always recommend if you're using twin flashes is the, the articulated arm. This one is from Photomat. Uh, it's a very, very expensive one. This costs around $600, so I don't recommend this. It's very, very expensive, but a very good, very good one. And if you want to spend less money, you can buy the Chinese one. It's a, a very cheap uh, articulated arm, but there's one problem. They are very, very fragile, so they will break for nothing. So but the price is less than 20 times cheaper than this one. So you can buy 20 of these unless, uh, if you don't want to buy this one, okay? In Brazil, we also have uh, a company called Indus Belo that makes the, this articulated arm that is a very good one, a very solid one. And we don't have this problem with this arm, but if you want to buy something cheaper, on eBay, you type dual macro arm and you end up finding this one. And okay, it, it, it's good enough for your initial photographies. Other thing you need to buy. So the final equipment, the ideal equipment is a DSLR camera. You can choose from different brands. 
I think, in my opinion, that Canon is the best option due to the price. If you set up all this equipment buying Canon, you end up with a cheaper equipment. Okay, the Nikon is more expensive and Sony is even more expensive than all of those two uh, all, from all of the street. And as you can see, you can buy a, or a Canon or DSLR. Uh, I'll totally agree right now that the T7i maybe is the best option. And original Canon macro lens, this, this is a 100 millimeters macro lens, amazing lens. A twin flash, you can, in, this, in the flash you can buy a young new uh, YN24EX is the model of the young new flash and end up with a macro arm and you have a very good equipment for starting at dental photography. As you can see, dental photography is uh, not very expensive. This equipment is not that expensive and you end up with good results. And you also need to, to photograph better to get the correct technique for what you're trying to achieve to buy a um, contrast mirror and regular mirrors. This is regular mirrors from Brazil and, and retractors, lip retractors. Uh, you have the V-shaped and the C-shaped. I almost don't use the V-shaped. It's very bad for us. It hurts the lips a lot. The C-shaped is very, very good. So the, buy the C-shaped and you're good to go, okay? Okay, uh, guys, uh, I think this is it. Uh, now I ha we have some question and answers here. And let's see. Uh, let me pause. The, uh, yes. let, go ahead. Yes. Uh, do, you, do you see the questions, uh, Dr. Veras? Uh, let me see uh, what pixel of camera do you use and which for remove the background. Okay, uh, let's see. First, first question, what pixel of camera do you use and which photo editor do you use to remove the background? Uh, first of all, uh, I don't remove the background. My background is exactly what you're seeing on the final picture. Uh, if I want a black background, I'll use uh, a contra contrast mirror. And if I want a white background, I'll use light. So I don't uh, remove the background anyway. But I do edit my photos for sure. Uh, the best software for this is Adobe Lightroom. It's the, the best for sure. Uh, it's a very good software for digital revealing your pictures. Uh, it's very easy to use and you have a lot of tutorials on YouTube so you can learn a lot of, uh, about this software. Uh, let me see the other question. Can, can we sort out a small room without the practice with an adequate lighting chair, camera and stand like a studio setting to take clinical photographs? Yes, doctor, for sure, for sure. Uh, if you're using that equipment that I recommended to you right now, you can use in a very, very small space. But if you want to use uh, a studio, yeah, uh, a, a professional studio with very big soft boxes and external flashes and everything, and then, then you may be needing a, a bigger space for your equipment. But otherwise, if you're using a twin flash, if you're using a camera and uh, a, 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 a articulated R, and then you don't need a very big space. Only a small space is enough to, uh, to result in a very good photography. I didn't understand why it, we, it's necessary to have a camera in the clinic. Uh, okay. Uh, if you want good pictures, if you want detailed pictures, if you want to make your work look professional and not amateur, if you want to sell uh, all of this, and then, yes, you need a professional camera on your office. If you want to stay sharing the same uh, bad pictures that you took with your cell phone, with bad light, with bad results, 
uh, making your work, your good work, looking awful, and then then you don't need the camera. <laughs> then you can <laughs> then you can continue using your cell phone, and the result will be awful every time. But if you want to take your work to the next level, you want a picture to uh, you want people to see you as a professional, as a very good dentist, and then yes, you need very good photography. You can, you can, you can say uh, for certain that every good teacher, every big reference in dentistry, they, have, they share all the same thing. They have good pictures. They have amazing material to show to other dentists or to your patients. So you need, yes, you need a very good camera to, to show how good you are. All right. I mean, Dr. Veras, this is amazing. This is just the tip of the iceberg. And, you know, because dental photography is not something yeah. you're going to learn in, in about mm -hmm. you know, 45 minutes. Uh, Dr. Yes. Yeah, Dr. Veras has a class online, and uh, I would gladly, uh, you know, recommend that you go on there and, and take a class I mean, you need to buy the equipment, the right equipment. He has said it all. I mean, I, I know how much I have tried. I have gotten myself. It has taken me some time, but I've, I've, I've gotten macro lessons. I've gotten twin flashes, and I'm, like, I'm listening to these people. I see, I, I go to Instagram. You know, I, I put up on Instagram. Our uh, Instagram page is uh, at Healing Hands. Uh, if, if, I want you, if you can follow us on Instagram, you'll see these pictures there. I see amazing work from around the world. And I'm like, I want, how do I take pictures like this? And, 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 and you need it to, to judge yourself. You need it to see mm -hmm. exactly what you're doing. Because sometimes you really don't mm -hmm. see until you take a photograph, you blow it on a screen, and you can see an undercut. Yes. <laughs> it's a crown prep. You probably won't see, you know, it, it's amazing. And it, it's for treatment planning, for, for mm -hmm. communication with the lab, for communication with your patients, for presentations. From, you know, it is, it is something, yeah. it, is, it, is, it, is, it has come to stay. And, and that is, thank you so much, Dr. Veras. Uh, I will be calling you back. Uh, you, you know, you'll go and bring uh, another aspect of it. Uh, this is just a very condensed way of, of presenting this. I really yeah. appreciate it. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, just remember that in my case, the dental photography was my best dentistry teacher I ever had. Because dental photography te uh, teach me by my mistakes. When I made the mistakes, I took a picture and said, oh my God, this is so bad. And then I looked at the picture and said, no, no, let's improve this. This is what photography can do for you. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, you. Nana. I would say uh, ob obrigado. Obrigado. Oh, obrigado. <laughs> Thank right. you very much. Okay. Thank you so much. We're going to move on. We're going to move on to the next. I just want to shout out to all our friends in Ethiopia. We have a lot of dental students in Ethiopia, and we have uh, one of their representatives here, uh, a student from Ethiopia, Dr. E uh, student El Eleni, and she's out there trying to encourage so many dental students to come on. I know you guys are at home. Uh, this lecture series is something you want to take part of. Those in Nigeria, I need you to come on. I need Nigerian dental students. I need, uh, you know, Ghanaian dental students. We need all the students. This is free. It is available for you. And uh, we're going to move on to the next. This, the next uh, speaker um, is... Um Healing Hands Health Society presents Dental Webinar Series. We have planned a series of dental webinars to keep you abreast of current practice. This series on prosthodontics will be via Zoom, Facebook Live. Presenters are drawn from dental schools in the USA, private practitioners from around the world. To register for future webinars, visit www.hhands.org dental training. For future inquiries, contact facilitator 